Our guest today is Dr. Alan Chim. He's an expert in ultrasound education, but he's also doing some very interesting work in a significant and important problem, and that's the management and identification of heart failure in the emergency department. Welcome, Dr. Chin. Thanks for having me here. Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure, I'm an emergency physician by training. I also have fellowship training in ultrasound under Chris Fox at Irvine. And um, for the past two years, I've been at UCLA, where I, along with some of my colleagues, had uh, resident training in ultrasound, as well as medical student training in ultrasound. The utilization of ultrasound in medicine, I think it's fair to say, is spectacular. But the implementation is a bit problematic. We have to be able to train our clinicians and our medical students. So help me understand a little bit about the value of training medical students and, and how that's going to play a role in potentially even improving patient care. Sure. I, I think like once you're done with your residency, once you're done with your, your training, it's really hard for you to uh, go back and learn a new skill like ultrasound. So it makes sense to actually start at, uh, during the first day of medical school where you can actually have a young captive mind and give them a new skill. And um, you know, one of the benefits with ultrasound education is that it helps to enhance the other subjects like anatomy and physiology. There's no better way of showing how the heart works than to actually put it on their own hearts, the medical students' hearts, and you could see the, their own valves opening and closing, their left ventricle contracting. I think that's how you actually learn, and you can apply that to different organ systems. And that's sort of what we're doing right now at that UCLA. That's interesting. So as I recall in medical school, students will use each other as patients. Right. Simple blood tests, stethoscopes. So ultrasound is an opportunity for them to learn on each other, but on themselves. Definitely. And it's a tool that helps them learn some of the core aspects of medical school, anatomy and physiology. What, is, what are the students' reaction to this? They, they love it. We've had uh, labs integrate with our anatomy course for the last two years, and we've had an, over, like an overwhelming positive response, so much so that right now our vice dean of education, Florence Braddock, he's actually formed an ultrasound task force to help us to decide where we need to go in terms of implementing ultrasound education in all four years of medical school. So you start early, first year. Right. So even when you're doing basic anatomy and physiology, right. what are some of the barriers or challenges that you see with using ultrasound or educating with ultrasound, both medical school and, and further along in the continuum? Sure, you, you always have to deal with uh, the space that you need. Um, the equipment itself is expensive, but probably more importantly is to be able to train the trainers. So to identify the faculty that are available to, to teach ultrasound. Um, what we do at UCLA is that we have residents that go through the rotation with us and they actually become our peer instructors. It's similar to what uh, other programs are doing where they have medical students, they train them in the first two years and then they come back as fourth year medical students to help as peer instructors for the first and second years. So is that the ability to acquire that teaching skill? Is that an added burden? to already busy physicians, or do they find it enhancing their skill too? I think it enhances their, their learning. Um, there's an old adage, uh, see one, do one, and teach one. And that helps you to uh, become competent in procedure or skill. And the same thing applies to ultrasound. You, you first learn about it, you do it, you practice it, but only when you're ready and able to teach that skill to someone else are you really a master of it. Isn't it interesting that you say see one, do one, teach one. With ultrasound, you really do get the chance exactly. to actually see one, not feel one or listen to one. So it seems like it's a, it's a real advance and, and both clinicians and students are taking to it. Right. I want to jump a little bit um, onto another condition, and that's congestive heart failure, uh, heart failure in the emergency room. First, let's talk about the role and the significance of that problem in clinical practice. Sure. It's, it's a, a huge problem in the U.S. We actually... Um, out of the patients that are discharged over age 65, their number, their number one diagnosis is heart failure. So it's responsible for over a million admissions every year. And the problem is that we can't keep them outside of the hospital. So the ones that are discharged from the hospital with heart failure, they, about a quarter of them actually come back. And from a, mon like a monetary perspective, about $20 billion are spent every year on just hospitalizations of acute heart failure alone. And that's B with a billion. Billion, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's actually larger than the, than the national budget for the Department of Education. It's larger than the budget for the National Institutes of Health. 
So it's a, a huge problem. We haven't figured it out yet. So we recognize that, that heart failure is a dilemma. It's a clinical challenge. It's also kind of tough, isn't it, to, to manage and, and diagnose and track. How does ultrasound improve that, that continuum of care? Well, I think right now what we do is we, we diagnose heart failure and we start them on standard treatments with nitrates, some diuretics. Um, the problem with that approach is that there are many different types of heart failure and there are many different severities of heart failure. So when you, when you uh, treat people on empiric medication just for a standard heart failure regimen, you actually predispose some people to complications. So sometimes they become hypotensive in the hospital or the ED. They have worsening, dehydration, and kidney injury. And those actually lead to increased mortality as well as hospital stays. So in order to, to um, address that approach, the National Institutes of Health, they've recommended that one of the things that we look at is, the, is ultrasound and to see if we can do the ultrasound, which is the traditionally the echocardiogram, which is done um, usually about 24 hours after they actually present to the emergency department. So in other words, 24 hours after they've received treatment. So you're really, you're trying to make a diagnosis of someone's hemodynamics 24 hours after they've actually received treatment. And I think that's actually too late. Instead, what we should do is try to do a, a focus ultrasound just on heart failure for known heart failure, heart failure patients before they actually receive treatment. And in that way, we can actually diagnose the, the subtype, how severe their exasperation is, and then we can start them on appropriate therapy. Okay, so you know, I think back to the Starling curve and LVDP and DPDT and all those complicated things. Right. I'm a busy emergency room doc. How can you quantify heart failure in a way that A, a clinician can understand it and becomes, it becomes a practical tool. What are the things you look at and, and how can we frame that up in a little bit of simplicity? Sure, um, so a focused heart failure ultrasound would consist of just looking at how, how well the LV is contracting, the mm -hmm. left ventricle. So we're looking at systolic function, we're looking at uh, whether there's presence of pulmonary edema on ultrasound, we're looking for systemic congestion with IVC uh, respiratory variability, and then the, really the, the, the new uh, modality is actually looking at diastolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And there have been a couple of, of smaller studies that look at how well emergency physicians can do that, as well as beginning uh, cardiac sonographers. And basically about 90% of the time you can get a really good view and you can do the same Doppler measurements. Wow, so, so you're looking at, at this both from a prognostic indices and the therapeutic indices. You can evaluate these patients and guide therapy based upon the ultrasound? Exactly, and, and that's the goal. Like that, The goal is to be able to see how they respond to treatment based on their initial phenotype or type of heart failure. And then if they respond well, you know, there's the question of whether we actually need to keep them in the hospital. So based on the large registries out there, um, you know, basically we discharge about only 10% of patients from the emergency heart with mm -hmm. acute heart failure. When based on these large numbers, we could probably discharge more up to maybe about 40 or 50 percent wow. of heart, heart failure patients. So when you when you shift from 10 percent to 30 or 40 percent, the associated shift in dollars right. is tremendous. Right. Just just a 25 percent reduction in hospital emissions will lead to savings of probably about $5 billion a year. How, what kind of support do you get from the cardiologists in this? Is it a turf battle? Is it something that they advocate? Are they using um, LV diastolic function as a, as a sign for failure now? Does it work with them? I think the cardiologists, um, they like the emergency physicians and the hospitalists, we're realizing that this is not a specialty specific mm -hmm. problem. It's, it's a healthcare problem. And in order to solve that problem, we need to collaborate. And so we have buy-in from the cardiologists in terms of this research project. Um, I have a small grant from the UCLA Clinical Tra Translational Sciences Institute for this project. And you know, hopefully we can demonstrate that emergency physicians with cardiologists on board can, can actually do th this focused procedure, which is the, the heart, heart failure ultrasound. And if we are able to demonstrate that they're able to, to, to be trained and they can accurately diagnose the different subtypes, the next step would be to actually to study it on patients. 
That's great. It sounds like you have sort of a triple combination, that you have the cardiologist on board, the emergency room physician, and also the empowerment of the patient. Right. That they can actually see LV dysfunction and recognize that they have to take control of their lives. I want to conclude by taking a 30,000 foot view of medicine today and talk about this concept of visual medicine. That it's no longer a number on a piece of paper, but it's the ability to visualize and to visually assimilate a variety of data, whether it be a pulse tracing or an ultrasound. How do you feel that's evolving in clinical medicine today? Is that an important trend that we should understand? I think these are really exciting times for medical education. We have concepts like flipping the classroom, we have concepts like uh, uh, enhanced active learning, and ultrasound really is, is comfortable with that, that vein because we actually, instead of just reading a textbook, you're able to show them how the heart works, how your gut uh, motility, motility works, how your eyes can constrict, et cetera, just on ultrasound. And I think that's very powerful. Uh, you know, we have a new generation of learners who, who uh, aren't really going to the classrooms. They're not really attending lectures. They're seeing everything online, on YouTube, and ultrasound is very well positioned to be a part of that. Great. Speaking visually, you've painted a wonderful portrait of the future of medicine. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.